I was in the Army so I could sound off. I assume you can hear me okay. Can anybody see me at all from where you are? I'm extremely short, as you can see. I, I, I'm overdressed. I see a couple of my, my Marine friends, Kevin Ainsworth and Joe Lisi, hanging out here, so I'm, I'm overdressed for you guys. Uh, who, any other Marines we have here? Uh, happy birthday. <laughs> in advance, in advance, happy birthday. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, although at my age, I'm delighted to be just about any place at all. Uh, and, uh, and it's good to be uh, with you to talk a little bit about service and sacrifice and patriotism. I've got a lot of friends here. Um, including Fred Tarter, who introduced me to the New York Film Academy in the first place. And I spent today uh, out talking with uh, students uh, and many veterans who are students at the New York Film Academy here in New York. It's very enlightening to talk with kids who've had some experience in the real world who are now trying to, uh, trying to educate themselves and learn a craft that's multifarious and extremely difficult to learn, uh, but for which there's a lot of demand. And one of the things I talk about when I speak to them is the following notion. You wouldn't think that people who spent time in the military are creative people, but if you stop and think about it a little bit, you realize that uh, people with military experience, particularly those who've served in combat, have to almost a priori be the most creative people on the face of the earth. Because those of you who spent time in combat know that this is true. If you do stuff time and time again the same old way, you die. And the only way that you can save yourself, the only way that you can take care of your troops, and the only way that you can achieve the mission is to think outside the box. The most successful people on the battlefield are always those who do things in a unique way, in a creative way. And therefore, although it sounds counterintuitive, the people who are probably best qualified uh, to be in this business, in the film business, in the TV business, in the creative business, are veterans. But it takes a little while to convince veterans that they are really the most creative people on the face of the earth. And once you do, they get it, because they've spent their entire time in uniform thinking outside the box and doing things not in a routine way. People who haven't served in the military don't understand that. They, you know, here are the orders, you go do it, everybody does it the same way. But those of us who have spent time in the crucible of combat know that if you do that, you're dead, and the only people who survive are the ones who think in a creative kind of way. Um, I, I spend uh, a lot of time, on an inordinate amount of time on television, uh, mostly talking to People who are either drunk or unconscious in their easy chairs, and you know, and, and I'm on MSNBC, which means that like I'm talking to three people most of the time. <laughs> well, that's about ready to change. Um, but it's a pretty good gig because I don't have to know anything. Uh, I I sit down. And they say, "What do you think about this?" I say, I, "I don't think very much about it at all." They say, "Thank you very much." They go to a commercial and they send me a check. <laughs> so it's it's really an excellent opportunity to. Uh, I mean, there's no outside work and no heavy lifting. It's great for somebody like me, who's inherently a stupid and b lazy. But I do have an opportunity tonight to talk with you, and in talking with live audiences, it's a lot more fun. It's a real treat for me because. Most of the time, like I say, I'm talking to uh, unconscious people, or sometimes dead people. I think statistically, if enough people are watching, some of them have actually expired while they're watching television. <laughs> With a terrible odor and they come holy mackerel, he's been watching Jack Jacobs. And so we're not surprised he's gone. Um, so this is a real treat for me. I talk a lot to kids in co at colleges and universities, middle schools and high schools, all of which is a great deal of fun because you, you actually get, perhaps, to influence the next generation of Americans. And that's, uh, that's probably the single most important thing that any of us can do. Uh, I fell into being on television by accident. I mean, like most things, it was by accident. 
they called me up one time from, they were, we were getting ready to go into Iraq, and they called me up and says, uh, um, your, na your name was given to us by some other guy who was, uh, who knew you when you were back at the National War College, and he says that you, uh, you should come on and talk about uh, the war because this is going to be a ground war, it's not going to be an air war, and you've been, you've been shot at, so you know about all this stuff. And uh, would you like to do that? And we'll send a car to come collect you. And we'll give you a sandwich when you get here. And I, I was always, and still am, mindful of Gore Vidal's uh, dictum that said, never turn down an opportunity to have sex or be on television. So I said, of course, I'll be, I mean, you know, send the car, collect it. <laughs> so they took me down, they put me on the air for like 90 seconds. They said it was really good, we'll come get you tomorrow. And do the same thing. I did it again. They said, well, we'll send a I said, you get two for free. Have your lawyer call me up. And that was like 13 years ago. They still haven't managed to find anybody as dumb as I am and uh, who's willing to you know, show up at some ungodly hour to talk on television. That it sometimes causes a great deal of consternation. And I'll tell you an anecdote about my being on the air. When the war started in Iraq, we were on like 24 hours a day, and I had a shift during the day and part of the night, and the guy who was the anchor all the time was Lester Holt, who now does nightly news and so on, Dateline. And Lester, uh, Lester's an Air Force brat, grew up in the Air Force, and he's six feet four inches tall. Even now, standing on this podium, I'm not six feet four inches tall. Matter of fact, I am, I'm at the eye level of Joe Lisi right now. I'm really a very small person. Which is great news, actually, because I've got a very small car with a footprint. <laughs> Not like Al Gore, he's got the world's largest carbon footprint. You know, he's got a house that's like 200,000 square feet and all that. And, uh, but I have no carbon. I can wear kids' clothes. And so on. <laughs> I don't use up any resources. But anyway, so Lester's 6'4", I'm like, I used to be 5'4", and now I'm shorter than that. And, uh, and so we're talking about, and we go to a commercial, we go to a break, and the new general manager of MSNBC comes out. His name is Mark Efron. Some of you may know him. He's a radio guy to start with when he was with PBS after uh, MSNBC. In any case, he comes out and he says, listen, he said, we're having, uh, this is not working. I said, what do you mean it's not working? He said, well, we're having a hard time getting you and Lester in the same shot. He said, when we zoom in and you're talking, we get Lester's armpit. That's not very, very distasteful. And when we pull back far enough to get both of you in there and you're talking, nobody can see you. It's like Lester's a ventriloquist. <laughs> <laughs> no good. So, <laughs> not a very nice man, was he? So, he says, this, this is what we're going to have to do. You're going to have to stand on a box. We're gonna have you. We're gonna we're gonna stand on the box. We're gonna stand on the box. Okay. So the the uh, the stagehands come over and they got a they got an actual box. They stand on the box. Come back from the break. Lester says, "Okay, so what's going on?" And we've got a sand table in front. I got a pointer and so on. Well, the Marines are coming up and they're crossing it on Nasiriya and the, you know the, here comes the 101st and this is where they are. All this razzmatazz. And after eight minutes, we go to another break. <laughs> But uh, Mark Efron didn't bother to tell anybody that I was standing on the box. Didn't call into the control room. He was going by, you know, the rundown tells you exactly what the shots look like and all the rest of that. And didn't bother to tell him I'm standing on the box. Didn't tell the senior producer or the executive. Didn't tell anybody. And at the end of this eight minute block, they we were going to a commercial. They had a bump shot. So they cut the audio so you can see me talking to Lester, but you can't hear me. And they pull the camera back to reveal my standing on the box. <laughs> it's the most horrific thing that ever happened to me on television. And then my phone starts ringing off the hook with people who used to be friends of mine leaving messages saying, holy crap, you're standing on a box. <laughs> and the worst came from my friend Tommy O'Grady. You know, you know O'Grady? One of only 200 people drafted into the Marine Corps during the war in Vietnam. 
calling from Pompano Beach, Florida at a topless donut shop. <laughs> and left me a message saying, do you know you're standing on the bottom? <laughs> because ostensibly he wouldn't know he was standing on the box and so on, and still does it. So. But that was the worst time I ever had. All the rest of the time on television is great fun, um, except that you've got to talk really fast, and you've got about 12 seconds to say everything you possibly can say, and that's, the end. that's why talking to you all is a, a great thrill. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little while, and then I'll open it up to questions, and since I've got an opinion on every subject, feel free to talk about anything. Um, uh, and if I don't know the answer, I'll make one up, which is what government officials do all the time, <laughs> since they don't know anything, and so everything they do is all made up. I was asked one time by Imus, back in the day when I could be on Imus, I can't be on Imus anymore, because it's, uh, it's on Fox, and NBC won't let me go, and he said, why don't you run for office? I said, well, for two reasons. First of all, you have to spend all your time raising money, and second, and worse, you have to be nice to people you can't stand. And so you got to think about what goes through people's minds when they say, oh, it's okay if I do that. I'm perfectly happy being nice to people I can't stand. It's sort of, anyway, I want to talk about politicians since none of us has any, uh, has any enthusiasm for them anymore. I forget who it was who said, don't ever watch the law or sausage being manufactured. You lose your taste for both of them. Probably Boswell or Dr. Johnson or something like that. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes. A perfectly reasonable guy to say that. I think some of the best uh, beautiful words come from people who served on the uh, who served on the court. Among my favorites is uh, Justice Potter Stewart, who opined in a in a in a uh, porn case. Says I I can't describe what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. And there've been lots of other. And I do too, by the way, so <laughs> they qualify me to be a Supreme Court judge. I tell you, I can do a better job in any case, but, we'll, but I digress, and we're getting into politics, which I'm happy to discuss later. I came into the Army through the ROTC program. Uh, I, I came in for a couple of reasons. The first was, as you heard there, I... I, I thought then, and I still think today, that everybody who's lucky enough to live in a free country owes it something in the form of service. I still feel that way. I feel very strongly about that. I think we are the poorer for, ha for outsourcing the defense of the republic to a very small number of young men and women who are willing to don the uniform and go defend, what, 320 million people. I think we're making a big mistake. Um, I think it disassociates the people being served from those who are serving, and while it's extremely comfortable, uh, I don't think it's healthy for the society because there's no sense that you actually have to do anything to defend the country because we have some people out there doing it. Um, you know, nowadays, when I, back in the Vietnam era, everybody hated the troops, even if they were dragooned into the service because they were going out to do, they were going out and fighting a war. Now we love them. We all love them. We love the troops. Every time we see them, we say, thank you for your service. You know why we love the troops? Because we don't have to be the troops. That's why. Do what Einstein used to call a thought experiment. Think about what would have happened in the last, what, 10, 12 years had we had a draft. And think about whether or not we would have had riots in the streets like we did in 67, 68, and so on. In a war where we now say, thank you, we love you, we love all your troops. And I think the independent variable is not whether or not we really like the troops, it's whether or not, whether or not we're all fighting. Uh, I'm a fan of universal service, not the draft, not selective service, not you're going, you don't have to go, you're definitely going. But I think everybody owes some service to this country. Otherwise, they got nothing in it. You got nothing, there's no ante. And without the ante, you don't really feel like you're part of it. We have, we have no common experience. We don't even have voting in common. More, a greater proportion of people votes in Iraq, where you get shot if you vote, than votes in the United States. We take everything for granted and we shouldn't. The second reason I came into the uh, military is because I went through ROTC and they, they paid you $27 a month, which wasn't even a lot of money back in those days. But I needed the money desperately because I'd done something you really shouldn't do. It's very, very stupid. I got married when I was 18 years old. 
Don't do that. Oh, well, it's too late for all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, very dumb thing. I've got, I've, I've got a daughter who I think is older than I am. I'm trying to, I mean, I got married. <laughs> really young. I was talking to somebody the other day, and since we're inside the cone of silence and I'm among friends, I can say whatever I want. Uh, you know you're getting old when your daughter's going through menopause. I mean, then you're old. <laughs> or in the alternative, you know you're getting old when your grandchildren have more sex than you do. <laughs> <laughs> this is all unsatisfactory, actually. <laughs> and so I needed the money. I really needed the money. And when I was, so don't, who's not married? Raise your hand. Stay that way. Oh, it's sufficient number. I recommend strongly you remain unmarried. And uh, I'll tell you what I told my kids when they were growing up. Uh, don't get married. <laughs> if you're intent on getting married, wait until the proper age to get married, which age is 85. That's the right age. <laughs> and if you can't wait till 80, you got it. You want to get married? I'm not waiting until I'm 85. Now my recommendation is that you keep your eye peeled for the ideal spouse. And the ideal spouse has two and only two salient characteristics. Number one, incredibly rich. <laughs> Number two, incurably ill. <laughs> and except, except no substitutes, really. I mean, they're mutually exclusive. You don't necessarily want to marry somebody incurably ill. There's nothing to leave you. So, well, I got married when I was very, very young, and by the time I was a, before I was a first lieutenant, I had two children, um, and was in the army making two hundred twenty-two dollars and ten cents a month. So I went airborne, and I went airborne not necessarily because I really felt like jumping out of airplanes, though it's a great deal of fun and so on, but because they paid you an extra one hundred and ten dollars a month, and so you don't have to be have a CPA to figure out that that's a fifty percent increase in salary just for jumping out of airplane. <laughs> and proving every month that you, every time you jump, that gravity works. You would think that the Defense Department would figure this out after a while. Wait a minute, jump last? We already know gravity works, let's not pay these guys anymore. But they continue to do it. I'll tell you something interesting I had just recently realized, and that is that the first time I ever flew in an airplane, the first airplane I ever flew in, I jumped out of it. <laughs> and matter of fact, the first five airplanes I flew in, I jumped out. So I had no landings. I had five takeoffs and no, no landings. And it wasn't until after I got out of jump school that I actually got on an airplane that actually landed in the end. I, my first, I, I went to the 82nd Airborne Division. Any 82nd people here? Well, there were earlier today back at the, at, at the academy. Um, and my... I was in Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion Airborne, 505th Infantry, and my, uh, my company commander was a guy named Hunter Shotwell. Now, I suppose if your name is Shotwell, you name your kid, you know, Ammo or Front Sight or, <laughs> Shot, or, you know, Hunter or something. He was a 1963 graduate of West Point where he played hockey and lacrosse and had no teeth as a result of that. Two very silly games. They're just like people just hit each other over the head with sticks. I don't get it. Uh, and he had gone to Vietnam. He was later to go back to Vietnam. And, uh, and a mortar round got in a bunker with him and killed him uh, in 1967-ish. About the time I was there. And, uh, uh, but in 1966, he was my company commander. I reported to him. And we shot the breeze in his office. And they said, well, now get out of my office. And I said, but sir, which platoon is mine? Those of you who don't have any military experience, a, a, an infantry company's got four platoons, each ostensibly commanded by a lieutenant uh, for about, about 40 people each. And he looked at me, and don't forget the war was getting started in earnest in Vietnam, so there were not a lot of officers around. As soon as you came in, they shipped you out. And he says, you must be joking. We're the only officers in this company. They're all yours. And I went instantly from being responsible for absolutely, positively nothing to being responsible for absolutely everything in the lives of 160 men. There is nothing like military service that gives young people authority and responsibility at a very early age, which is something I try to remind veterans when they say, well, what can I do? 
What are you talking about? What can you do? You can do anything you want to do. You've already done everything you could possibly do. So you have plenty of experience. Years later, when I retired from the Army, I was teaching at the National War College in Washington. Uh, which is ostensibly the highest level of military schooling there is. And a lot of the people there, most of the people there grow up to be admirals and generals and all that stuff, ambassadors and so forth. And I left and uh, I retired on the 1st of February 1987 and went to Wall Street. And I got calls from people who were still there, students of mine, asking me, how was it out there? As if I were on parole. And they were coming up, coming up for a work release hearing. No, should I get out? Maybe I should stay in. And I told them that uh, not to worry. That everybody I saw on the outside who was a success either had military experience or was innately of a military mind. Because all the things you need to know in order to run large and small organizations to be successful were all the things that we teach young soldiers and sailors, airmen and marines from the time they're 18, 19 years old. Like, for example, like the principles of war, which include, among other things, something that we almost invariably forget in our personal lives, in government, in business, and that is the principle of the objective, which for my money is the single most important of all the principles of war. Without it, nothing else makes any sense. Everything else is irrelevant. And yet we frequently allocate resources when we have not articulated what it is we're trying to accomplish. But put yourself in uniform and talk to some private, no-class dog face, and you can't get them to do anything unless you first tell them what it is we're trying to do. And so one of the things we learn in the military is you've got to start at the end and work backwards. What's your strategy? How are you going to know you're finished? What if you work backwards? And we don't do that. We don't think about... Think about what we do, what our government does, and you'll realize that we don't have strategies. It's infrequent that we have articulated what we're trying to accomplish. And so it's not surprising that everything goes to hell in a handbasket, because we allocate resources to accomplish things that we haven't articulated. If it seems like everything that we do uh, is piecemeal, is fragmented, because it is, to the extent that any of us makes... Uh, mistakes in our personal lives, the same reason. To the extent that we, uh, in business, don't accomplish what we want to accomplish, it's pretty much, it's often for the same reason. We have not stated what our objective is. We would do well to do what young troops get taught when they're really, really young in everything that we do. Because in the end, we're just going to, th we're throwing money, people, and time down a rat hole, and we shouldn't do that. And then we're going to wonder how come we're in trouble. Uh, when we have a lot of resources, we have a tendency to just throw resources at a problem without articulating the problem. Uh, a very, bad, very, very bad thing to do. One of the things we learn to do in the military is that we learn to husband resources. We learn that we can't predict the future, that we have to prepare for failure, and that we have to have stuff in reserve. And for two reasons. First of all, we may fail and we may have to throw assets at it. And if we allocated all of our assets, we're not going to have any to do it. And second, if we're successful, you have to throw more assets at it so that you can hold on to what you've got. There's an inexorable, inexorable rule that I try to keep in mind all the time in whatever I do, and I try to teach kids this too. And that's this, and, and, it, and it works in just about everything that we do. It always takes more resources to hold on to an objective than it does to take it in the first place. I've taken a lot of objectives sometimes by myself, sometimes with a few other petrified soldiers, and been run off of more than half of them. Why? Had enough to get on the objective, but not enough to stay there. I can tell you lots of anecdotes about that. Um, the same thing is true in business. Most businesses fail in the first year. Why not enough resources? Haven't planned for enough resources. And if you're successful in the first year, you don't have enough resources to hold on to what you've gotten and it dissolves. And I hate to keep harping on marriage, but marriage is pretty much the same thing. It's easy to get married. I know I've done it several times. <laughs> it's much harder to hold on to stay being married than it is to get married in the first place. 
And if we think, those of us who are married know that if you think that you can kind of slide in there and everything's going to be okay until you drop dead, you got another thing coming. Um, there are lots of lessons I learned. All of them uh, have served me well, and almost everything that I've learned that's worth a damn I learned when I was a young soldier. And I think a lot of our troops can say the same thing, especially when they get older and have a chance to look back. 